for the CD Your Pants Hangout. Um, thanks for joining us today. I'm going to be your host, Sarah Provado. And for those of you who are maybe just be joining in for the first time, Exploring by the CD Your Pants is all about bringing adventure, science, and conservations to classrooms across North America and beyond. And today we have about 80 students joining us. And before I introduce our guests today, I just want to say hello to our classrooms. So I'm going to go around and introduce um, who we have joining us today. So we have a group of grade twos coming in from Connecticut. We have Miss um, Erickson's grade twos. If you guys want a chance to say hello, <laughs> we can say hey to you guys today. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. And now we have Miss Jenny's classroom coming in from Washington. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> and then we have Miss Deer's classroom, a group of grade sevens coming in from Virginia. Hey guys, how are you doing today? <laughs> awesome, thanks for joining us. And then we have, last but not least, oh, sorry, that was not a group of grade sevens, but um, <laughs> I got a little confused there. So this is the group of grade sevens. We have Miss Beth's, uh, Miss Deer's group of grade sevens coming in from Virginia here. Hi guys, again. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Miss Lakeman's classroom. They're a group of grade twos coming in from Ontario. Hey, all <laughs> right. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi guys. Okay, so looks like we have a good crowd today. And so the Hangout is just going to go. I'm going to introduce Heather, and then I'll let her take over. I'll give her a chance to talk about all the awesome stuff that she's been doing. And then we'll go around to each classroom and have a chance for questions so you guys can ask a real-life biologist any burning questions you might have. <laughs> um, so I will turn it over to Heather. Thanks for joining us today, Heather. Yeah, you bet. Hey, how are you guys? Everybody looks good. Can everybody see me okay? I can see everybody pretty good. So I hope you can see me. All right. So have you guys ever heard of this bird called a long-billed curlew? All right, a couple hands going up. So I have one behind me. Can you guys see that right there? Look how long that bill is. Isn't that crazy? Can you imagine if your bill was that long? I'll turn my head and we can kind of pretend. Ready? Is that lining up? That's a really long bill, right? So I study these birds for the Intermountain Bird Observatory here in Boise, Idaho. And so I like to start out by showing you guys a skull of a long-billed curlew. So I hope you guys can see that okay. It might be kind of hard. I'll try to hold it up a little bit. Maybe I'll line it up with that bird back there. But what do you think a long-billed curlew needs a bill that long for? So I wish I could interact with you guys. So I'm just going to let you guys talk about it. But these guys eat insects and worms when they're up in the Intermountain West areas where we study them. And look how far down in the ground, if that was the ground, how far that bill can go down in there, right? And so they're picking up bugs and worms, but this is what's called a migratory species. So these guys live their life at one place for part of the time for breeding, and then they fly to another place um, to where they spend their winter. So right now these birds are in Mexico and California, but guess what? They're all on their migration back to the Intermountain West and including Idaho here. So I'm gonna see these birds in a couple of weeks. So why I like to show you this is because even though he's got this really long bill, he can't hurt anybody with that. Because if he starts to chase away a predator or something that's bothering um, the eggs or the chicks, and he tries to hit him with that bill, the lower part of that bill is going to break off like that. And then they're not going to be able to eat anymore, right? And so they don't have talons like raptors either, right? Like red-tailed hawks or owls have really sharp claws called talons. Well, these guys don't have those, but they have a different adaptation that's gonna scare predators away. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. So let me go ahead and bring my presentation up to show you guys what these guys look like. OK. 
Okay, you ready? So this, whoops, sorry about that. All right. So this is a long build curlew. And it looks kind of strange, right? Those long legs and it's got a really funny looking neck and long bill. It kind of looks like he should be out maybe on the coastline, which that's, like I said, where he's at right now. And sometimes they're inland where there's mud flats and um, water available. So you guys might be familiar with a little bird called a killdeer, which is related to the curlew. And they nest on the ground. And if a predator gets too close to their nest, they'll pop off the nest and act like their wing is broken. So like I said, he's in the same family as the curlew, but the curlew is considered the largest of the North American shorebirds. And they love our grassland habitats because they nest on the ground. And you'll find them a lot of times like where you find cattle and cows because they keep the grass at a low level. So when the curlews are on their nests, they can watch out for predators. And that bill can grow up to about eight and a half inches long. And I don't know if anybody out there has ever held a chicken or a duck before, but these guys weigh about a pound or two. And I'd like to play you their call so you know what they sound like. So let's give it a shot. So that's basically just a little contact call that they do to let each other know where they're at. So in our area, this bird has been in a lot of trouble here in Southwest Idaho. So they have to always be on the lookout for predators, right? And so some of these predators would include coyotes, badgers, weasels, um, snakes can get into the nest. Um, but they also have troubles with other things too, like humans, because where I study these birds are on these big tracts of land and um, they're, the land is open to the public. It's the public lands we have out here. So you can go out there and ride your motorcycles. You can ride your bikes, horses. You can hike. Um, you can go target shooting. Um, and so when you have human impacts like that, that can cause troubles too, right? And so we're finding out that sometimes this bird's behavior gets him into a little bit of trouble. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. So I don't know if that showed up for you guys well or not, but there's a male and a female on the screen there. And can you tell that they're different sizes? So the boy is in the front. And he's a little bit more streamlined and smaller with a smaller bill. And then the one in the back is a female and she is much bigger and has a longer bill. And so that kind of helps me when I'm out in the field looking for these guys because they actually share the incubation duties, which means sometimes during the days and nights, the mom and the dad switch on and off the nests. So the females sit with the eggs all day and the males sit on the eggs all night. So it's important for me to know who's up and about uh, to hopefully help me find a nest. So here's a little video. I hope it comes through okay. Um, just to show you guys how they use that bill and how far down in the mud they can get. So this curlew is in California. And so he's looking for little crustaceans and uh, maybe some little, uh, they call them ghost shrimp and little tiny fish. So when you are a ground nesting species, it's really, really important that you blend in with your environment. And so these guys have an adaptation to help them do that. And it's called camouflage. I'm sure you guys have all heard of that before, right? So they wanna be really sneaky and not attract any attention. So if you look at that curlew down in the right-hand corner, um, she's actually sitting on her nest and she's sitting really tight and low. So it makes it harder for predators to see her. And then when you look at the eggs in the upper left-hand corner, they're camouflaged too. So they basically just look like rocks sitting on the ground. And it's gonna be the entire life cycle that is camouflaged, right? So it would have to be the adults, the eggs, and even the little chicks. 
So as you can see, they blend in really good with their surroundings too. In fact, you can barely see that one little chick on the right-hand side of your screen um, is blending in with the cheek grass. And so they need to be up and running out of that nest when their feathers dry off, because if they just hang out there, um, a predator might find them. So here's another little video of some chicks that are actually standing up, which is super cute. So when the parents are incubating their eggs, they try to stay as quiet as they can, right? Remember how I said they don't want to attract any attention? Well, they actually change when a chick hatches out of the egg. So what happens is the adults are going to become really aggressive and defensive. So if a coyote or a badger goes walking by, that curlew is going to get really upset and try to chase that badger or coyote away. But remember, they're not going to hurt it with their bill and they don't have talons. So what do you guys think they can use to chase a predator away? I'll give you a second to think about that. Well, what they do is they have a blood curdling call that they use, and it's going to attract all the other curlews that can hear that call. So I want to play that for you. So you know, if you ever heard this, it's the curlews trying to tell you that you're too close to a nest or too close to a chick. So it's a really loud, crazy scream that they do. And like I said, um, what they do is they start screaming and they do, do a dive bomb. So they come and they drop out of the sky and we call it mobbing. And you guys have probably already seen this before. So have you ever seen like a red tail hawk or a big raptor go flying by and there's all these little tiny birds chasing its tail through the air? That's what mobbing is. So that raptor probably got a little too close to a nest that was in a tree and didn't even know it. And all those little birds came out of that tree and started calling to try to chase that raptor away. So this is the part of the program that we hope you guys will want to be involved in and help us with. So we have a satellite tracking program. And what that means is that we trap some of the birds and we put identification bands on their legs. And then we put this little satellite transmitter on its back. And so the, the transmitter is solar powered. So the sun is going to power up a little battery that's inside of it. And so by doing this, we're able to track where the birds go when they're on their breeding grounds during the summer. And then we can track them all the way back down to their breeding or their wintering grounds uh, in Mexico and California. So after we trap the birds, we start to process them and we'll put bands on their legs. And we also take other measurements and we write all of this data down. And after we get all that data taken is when we go ahead and attach the transmitter. And you can't see it in this picture, but the transmitter sits on the bird's back and it sits on a really soft little pad and there's leg loops. So there's loops that actually go around the thighs of the bird. But we obviously don't wanna just put a piece of technology on the bird and just let it go without making sure that that bird is comfortable with that transmitter on, right? So it's really kind of crazy, but we developed a way that the curlews can let us know that they're uncomfortable. So what we do is we set up this little camping tent and we put the bird inside the tent and it's going to do one of two behaviors. It's either going to sit down right away or it's going to run around in the tent like crazy. So I'll give you guys a second to think about what do you think that bird's going to do if it was uncomfortable? Let's take a look. So the bird actually sits right down. So if you guys could imagine 
let's pretend say your pants all of a sudden are three sizes too small. Are you gonna feel like getting up and running down the hallway? Probably not. You're gonna wait for somebody to bring you another pair of pants that fits you so you're comfortable, right? So what we'll do is we'll take the bird out of the tent and then we'll readjust that transmitter and then we put the bird back in the tent. And then this is what we wanna see. We want to see that bird kind of running around, standing up, and it's not worried about the bands that we put on its legs. It's not worried about that transmitter that's on its back. All that curlew can think about is getting back to the chicks and back to the nest. So here is a link that you guys can go to with your teachers, or um, you can also look at a poem with your parents. And so this link is gonna take you to our satellite tracking map. And you're gonna be able to check on all of the birds that we put transmitters on. And so what you can do is you press on any one of those colored dots that you see on the screen and a little window is gonna pop up and it's gonna tell you the bird's name. And it's also gonna tell you when the satellite sent the last signal between the satellite and the transmitter. And so it's really cool because you can check on the birds any time of day, so 24 seven. And another cool thing is you can zoom in on each one of those dots like I did in the lower left-hand corner. And you can actually start to see their, my, their uh, track line. So those lines are showing you where those birds went all day long. So you can also change what the color of the map looks like. If you want that map to look more like a, a regular map, like you're used to seeing, like an atlas, you can change it to look like that. And when you do that, or you can even use a, a, a satellite imagery, you can see when they're heading to the agricultural fields, because remember they eat insects. So if there's a farmer's field around, that might be a really cool place to go look for some insects, right? And then you can see when they go to the water, or maybe they go to the river, or maybe they go to the coast. So it's a lot of fun to check on all these birds and see where they're going. And if you guys get on this map today, you're gonna see quite a different picture come up on your screen because all of the birds are starting their migration back to their breeding grounds. In fact, our four transmitted Idaho birds are already back on the grounds now, which means I need to get out in the field and start looking for them um, with our curlew crew. So feel free, like I said, um, your teacher will have this link and you can check on the birds anytime. So when we first started studying these birds, we would find them sometimes out in the field in pieces, like you can see up in this upper left hand corner. You can kind of tell there's a wing over here, the head is over here, and there's um, the rest of the body over here on this side. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. Um, but anyway, that kind of looks like a coyote got it or maybe a, a badger got it, right? So we developed a partnership with the Idaho Department of Fish and Games Wildlife Health Laboratory. So this is a really cool place that tries to figure out what killed an animal. So it's, um, it's like a forensics wildlife lab. So those people said that we could bring any birds that are dead into their lab and they would x-ray them for us. And so we thought, well, that would be great. So when we took it in, this was our very first x-ray we got back. And again, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but um, so these are the bones, the bluish purple parts are bones. And then check out what's in this red circle right in here. It looks really bright white. And I don't know if you guys know this or not, but metal shows up really bright white in an x-ray. So what we're actually looking at here is these are metal fragments from the bird getting shot. So when we look back at this other picture, originally we thought a predator had gotten it. But the real story now that we have the x-ray is that the bird was shot originally and left there on the ground and then the scavengers came to get the bird. So this really 
changed how we were thinking we were going to have to deal with the decline of the curlew, right? Because these birds are in a 95% decline in our area. So we have been studying why this is. And so with all the, the recreational target shooting that happens on the lands, we've actually discovered that a lot of our birds have been getting shot. And a really important thing to remember is these birds are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, right? And so what that means is it's illegal to shoot these birds and any other migratory bird species. And if somebody were to get caught, they could get in a lot of trouble and have to pay a lot of money and do some time in jail. So it's really important when you go through your hunter's ed classes to learn what you can and can shoot because it's really, really important and especially being safe on the public lands too. And so since we started transmitting our birds, about half of them have been poached. And if you don't know what poached means, that means illegal shooting, okay? So we're finding out that there's a lot of illegal shooting that's happening with these guys. So we are now going into hunter's ed classes and teaching students about the protected species that are out there and how important it is to know your target. And so we're really excited that this um, poster is now in our hunter's ed manuals to help raise awareness for not just the curlew, but for other raptors too that are getting poached. So we're really trying to spread the word about all these different species that are struggling to survive. And so that's why I'm talking to you guys today is to hope that you guys will wanna help spread the awareness and tell people how cool these birds are and how much trouble they're in. Because they're not just in trouble here in Idaho, but there's curlews in other parts of the world that are in trouble too. So this is a big thing in biology is to be able to study and then be able to educate people about what you're studying. And that's what I love to do and why I'm here talking to you guys today. So I'm hoping we can open it up to some questions because I'm sure I didn't tell you guys everything you wanted to know about this bird. I just wanna make sure we have enough time for everybody to participate. Awesome, great talk, Heather. Um, and you did great on time, by the way. <laughs> Perfect, so we'll set it up. Um, we will go. We will start with Miss Deer's classroom, her group of grade sevens. If you guys want to ask a question, you guys can do so. Just unmute your mic here. Perfect. Hey, how are you? Hi, I was wondering what made you want to study this particular bird? Um, well, I started volunteering with the Intermountain Bird Observatory. I'm working with um, a whole bunch of different types of birds. But this project was just really, really interesting to me um, because how often do you see a bird that looks like that? Like that is a crazy looking bird. So I just wanted to learn more about it and why it is, how it is, and learn how I could help it. Because like I said, the, uh, the decline is really alarming, right? So I didn't get a chance to mention this, but um, the 95% decline has been over the course of 40 years. And I'm sure in some of your science classes, you're learning about like a geological time scale. Well, 40 years is not very long. And so that's why this bird kind of rose to the top um, for me wanting to help the team try to figure out what's going on. So great question. All right, we'll move to Miss Lakeman's classroom. Um, she has a group of grade two and threes. So the Ontario group, if you guys want to ask a question, you have the floor. Hey guys. Hi. Hi. We wanted to ask, why are they called curlews? Wow. Um, you may have stumped me a little bit. Um, I've done some reading where they think that when the bird's doing its call, it sounds like it's saying curlew, curlew which is kind of doesn't sound right coming from me, but, um, and the Latin name for it um, is Numenius Americanus, which um, is Greek and talks about the shape of the bill 
kind of looks like a curve of the, the moon, the crescent moon. So that was a great question. And I really should look more into that. But the most things that I've heard about is because of the, the sound of the song that it makes. Excellent. <laughs> okay, moving on, we will go to Miss Jenny's classroom. Um, they are coming in from Washington. If you guys want to ask a question, you can do so. Hey guys. Um, how long can a long uh, build curlew fly? How long can it fly? Um, well, let's see. I guess the a cool example that I have is talking about its migration. And so remember how I said the birds are starting to migrate back to the breeding grounds? We had one curlew that we tracked going, actually, let me ask you guys, let, let's see what you guys think. How long do you think it would take a curlew to fly from California to Idaho? Just throw out some numbers. One million, um, 80 days, uh, 60, 60 Wow, good, hours, good guesses, good guesses. Hours, <laughs> 12 hours, 12 hours. So that's not very long at all. So he probably had some good weather and a good tailwind and he got back to Idaho lickety split. But when you guys are able to get on the computer and check that map with your teacher, you'll see that the curlews actually make stops all along the way. Sometimes they have to fuel up and maybe eat some more bugs to get some more energy or they may uh, have to stop because what happens if a thunderstorm moves in? They might have to come down and seek some shelter because it might be too hard for them to fly in a storm, right? Uh, and so when you guys get on the map, you'll be able to see them making those stops. So that was a really great question. And that's more reason to add to the database that you guys are making. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are questions that scientists are still trying to figure out. Um, we will to our next classroom. We have Miss Bergman's classroom. I believe this is the classroom coming in from Connecticut. Oh, question for your Lita, go ahead. Um, Lita, come on up, Lita. Hey guys. Why do people just think it's 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 not illegal to poach? Oh, about the curlews. That's a really great question. So, um, you know, I really think, like I'd mentioned, remember how I said they go kind of crazy when their chicks hatch and they start dive bombing and mobbing? So I think what might be happening is if people are out on the public lands and they're having a great day and they're target shooting um, and they happen to be too close to a chick or maybe too close to the nest, um, then one curlew is going to come and dive bomb and then another one and then another one. So I'm thinking maybe if a bunch of curlews are screaming and scaring the people that maybe they turn and shoot the birds to get them to go away. Do you see what I mean? So I'm thinking that if I can educate as many people as I can to not be afraid of the bird when they do that, that maybe they won't get shot. Right. So, and I failed to mention this to you guys, but all you have to do to get the curlews to stop mobbing you is to walk away because you won't see the chicks or the eggs, right? Because they're super camouflage, right? And so that's why we're trying to get the word out to not be afraid. The curlews don't have talons to hurt you and they can't use their bill. They're just trying to defend their family, just like our moms and dads would do, right? Like if there's a stranger that comes by, your mom and dad are going to go crazy just like this bird. So that's why I'm hoping if people knew why the birds acted the way they did, they would go, oh, well, duh, they're just protecting their family. So why don't we just pack up and go down the road? So hopefully if we can tell enough people, it'll really help the curlews. So that was a really good question. Thank you. We got a good stream of questions going. So we'll continue yeah. with a little bit more time. So we'll head back to our first classroom classroom with Miss Deer's class. If you guys want to ask a question, just unmute your mic 
and you'll be able to do so. Wait, where's the camera? Okay. Hey, how, how are you? Long should, how, <laughs> how long do you cur curlew eggs incubate for? That's a really good question. Um, in fact, I have one here if you guys would like to see it. Can you see that okay? Yeah, go up here. So the incubation period is about uh, anywhere between 28 and 31 days. And so how we can kind of figure out when to go back to the nest is we're gonna have a little like a Tupperware of water. And then we put the egg inside that Tupperware. And wherever that egg will float inside of that container tells us how old the eggs are. And so then we kind of do the math and we can figure out, okay, 30 days from however old that egg is, is when we go back to check on the nest. And so it's really cool process. Um, and it's really special when you actually get to see a curlew chick, which doesn't happen a whole lot where I'm at, um, but it's fun when you get to. That's really cool. Do, does the weight change based off of how developed the egg is? Like exactly. The, you know, the more air, the more developed the chick is, the more air is in the egg. So it's going to float higher in that container. So if it's just been laid, it's going to sink to the bottom because there's no, not, no big air pockets in there to have it float up. And so I think a lot of farmers use that technique sometimes for chickens. And I don't know if you can tell, but I'll hold it in my hand to maybe give a better perspective, but it's just a little bit bigger than a hen's egg. And they're really beautiful. And there's no, there's no chick in this egg. It was uh, unfertilized, so it never developed. But it's really cool that I have one to be able to show students what they look like uh, live in real time, I guess. Very cool. Okay, good questions we got going on. So we'll move on to Miss Lakeman's classroom. If you guys have another question, you guys can ask it right here. I just need you guys to unmute your mic, I think. There we go. I have one. There we go. Do the, do the birds Hello. call out when you catch them? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Do the birds call out when you catch them? Yeah. So, Ashley, well, let me back up. So, when we trap them the day we're going to band them and put the transmitters on, they're still incubating. And I don't know if you remember, but what I mentioned when they're still on the eggs and there's no chicks yet, they try to be as quiet as they can because they don't want to attract any predators or any attention to them. So what they do is as you get closer to them, they sink down to the ground and they get like flat as a pancake and you can barely see them. So we have a biologist up on a hillside kind of far away with a big scope that they're watching the bird on the nest. And then that person directs the other two people that carry a really long, soft net down to the nest. But those people can't see the bird because it's sitting so low. So the people that are up on the hillside let the other people know when to drop the net when they're right over the bird. So it's a really neat process. So during that time, the bird stays really quiet, but it really changes when we then have to go up and check on a nest because guess what? The chicks are starting to hatch when we check them again. And what do the parents do? They go crazy. So that's the two different times when they either call or they don't call. So that was a good question. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. Let's go to Miss Jenny's class. If you guys wanna unmute your mic. Ready? Oh. <laughs> Are we in Miss Jenny's classroom? Yes. Oh, we just had a question on how birds find their way. Ah, oh, so this is something that is, uh, this topic is alive and well in the scientific community. So there's a lot of different studies about how birds can remember where to come back to. And there's a lot of different things going on. Uh, they kind of feel like they have an internal compass somewhere um, in their brain that works with the magnetic fields around the earth. 
So it's almost like they, they were born with a map in their brain. Wouldn't that be great? You wouldn't have to be using your phone to get around or, or your computer to get around with the GPS. It would all be built right into your head. So that's how they feel that they know where to go. And some birds even migrate at night and they think that they use the stars to navigate, which is super cool. And that actually brings up another issue that a lot of light pollution, like a lot of our city lights might actually be creating too much light for the birds to be able to navigate and see the stars. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that scientists feel that birds can find their way. So that was a really great question, class. Good job. <laughs> okay, and then we'll move on to Ms. Erickson's classroom. We got a couple of hands up. You can follow up with that. Cool. I see nothing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there you are. Hey. How long have been, people been killing long birds? Oh, that, you know, that's a really good question. Um, we don't really have an answer. Um, but what I do know <laughs> is that, remember how I said this decline has been going on for 40 years? Well, I guess a long time ago, the area where we study these birds used to have the the highest population of curlews in the United States. So people started noticing about 40 years ago that they just weren't seeing the same amount of these birds that they used to on the land. So that's when they kind of contacted some of our uh, agencies out here. Like, I don't know if you guys have heard of the Bureau of Land Management, it's called the BLM, and also the Fish and Game. And so they alerted them and that's when everybody started kind of getting involved and partnering up to try to figure out what was going on. So shooting could have been happening for a long time, but we haven't really gotten the proof until we started getting some of our birds x-rayed. And that's a great thing about science, right? Because in the beginning, we thought predators were getting the majority of the birds, but we were wrong because we didn't know because we couldn't look inside the bird, right? So once we were able to start x-raying them, then we were able to kind of say, whoa, so shooting might be a, a much bigger problem than we thought. And so that's why, like I said before, we're trying to educate as many people as we can about how cool this bird is and that it's protected under that, that law, that Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So thank you. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we're just coming up on time here. We had a good chance great. to facilitate a conversation about this really cool bird that Heather seems clearly passionate about. Um, so thanks everybody for joining. Uh, if you guys have any, if you guys would really like today, convince your teachers to go back to exploringbythecityyourpants.com and see what other cool scientists or explorers that uh, interest you and join back in for a hangout so we can see you guys again soon. So thank you so much for your time today, Heather. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, we learned lots today. Um, so if everybody just wants to give Heather a big round of applause and thank her for her time. Thanks to you guys. Awesome, thanks for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon on another exploring. Have a good day, guys.